Welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series, which can be heard on VHHA.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get podcasts. We're a member of the Public Health Podcast Network, the Virginia Audio Collective, the Independent Podcast Network, and the Family Podcast Network. And we're on the radio each Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, 107.7 FM, and 820 a.m. across Central Virginia, and 1650 a.m. in Hampton Roads, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send any questions, comments, or feedback to PCFpodcast at VHHA.com. Again, that's PCFpodcast at VHHA.com. And today we're excited to be joined by John Hollis, who is a spokesman at George Mason University. He is a former journalist and he has what you might call a superpower, which is extreme immunity to COVID-19. We're going to talk with John about himself and also about how he got this very intriguing and rare uh, medical diagnosis. So with that, welcome to the podcast, John. Thanks for being with us. Julian, thanks for having me here. It's always a pleasure. Appreciate it. Well, we're excited to talk about this. So let's just start with your medical status. As I understand it, you discovered during the height of the pandemic that you are not only immune to COVID-19, but that you also have super antibodies that actually aggressively target and defeat the virus. This is a, a true medical phenomenon, and the scientific data suggests that only four men worldwide are known to have this so-called super blood. Some have even started calling you uh, an immunological unicorn or an immunicorn. So let's start there. Just tell us about how you found out about this condition and these antibodies that you have. Sure. It goes back to the start of the pandemic. George Mason scientists, like most scientists around the world, immediately pivoted to COVID research once the pandemic began. And I, as a university spokesman at George Mason University, just happened to be working with George Mason scientists, particularly the lead scientist, Dr. Lance Liotta who's the head of George Mason's Center for Applied Proteomic and Molecular Medicine, and he's also a former deputy director of the NIH. And so I had met with them in the beginning of the pandemic as they began to do their COVID antibody research, which was available for all George Mason students, faculty, and staff who had either tested positive for the virus or thought they had been exposed to it. I, of course, wasn't in the study because I didn't think I'd ever been sick. I didn't even know that I'd been sick, so there was never even a thought of myself getting in the study. It wasn't until months later, late July, early August 2020, when I met with Dr. Yoda in person, they were finishing up the study. I just happened to mention to him that a friend of mine who I was living with, I was going going through a divorce, I was living with a former newspaper colleague, and a friend of mine who I was living with, he had gotten COVID and he almost died. He was incredibly, terribly sick and almost died. And I just happened to mention to Dr. Yoda in passing, on my way out the door, basically, that I was so lucky to have avoided the virus myself. And that's what opened the door for me to be an 11th hour addition to their study. Two days later, I was back in their office giving blood and saliva samples. And, of course, I didn't even think I'd been sick. I didn't even know I'd been sick, let alone have any super antibodies that might be make me immune or anything like that. So you can imagine my complete and utter shock when Dr. Leota called me after hours, no less, two days later, when I, I knew I had no phone calls or messages into him. It tells me, John, not only did you have COVID and not know it, but you have super antibodies that make you immune to the virus. I mean, I was completely shocked. My jaw was on the absolute floor. Do you wish you could focus on practicing medicine without all the distractions? Covaris is here to help. As a leader in medical professional liability insurance with more than 45 years experience, Covaris provides insurance protection with data-driven predictive modeling to help you mitigate the risk of claims. By combining insurance protection with risk analytics services, you can reduce distractions and focus on improving clinical, operational, and financial outcomes. Covaris is reinventing what you should expect from your medical professional liability provider. Find out all Covaris can offer you at Covaris.com. That's C-O-V-E-R-Y-S.com. Insurance products issued by Medical Professional Mutual Insurance Company and its insurance subsidiaries, Boston, Massachusetts. Talk a little bit about the rarity of this. I I mentioned that earlier. In thinking about and preparing for this episode, I recalled a television show that used to air several years ago, probably about 10 years ago now. It was hosted by Stan Lee, who people who are into comic books may remember as, as sort of the godfather of Marvel Comics. And it was called Superhumans. And it documented actual living people who had unique genetic phenomenon or unique genetic gifts, you know, not actual, you know, superpowers, but, you know, people that, you know, could 
be extreme endurance runners and, and the way their body processed uh, oxygen was different from other people. And, and in thinking about your story, it, it just made me think of, of that television series that chronicled, you know, the rarity of the fact that there are people who have genetic gifts that are unique from the vast majority of the human population. So I just want to hear your thoughts about that, just, you know, the rarity sure. of this, this condition that you have, which is, you know, sounds like a blessing. It really is. I mean, it's kind of overwhelming. It's been overwhelming, especially the first, probably the first year or so, the whole th- first year, just been overwhelming to think about. I mean, basically, super antibodies are basically what kills antigens in your body. And my body, in response to being exposed to the virus, created these so-called super antibodies. And then not only did they create the super antibodies, but like you mentioned, but they are also incredibly powerful and aggressively kill the virus. My blood, even when diluted 10,000 times, still kills 90% of the virus. But lots of people with super antibodies, they all each have varying levels of strength and, and protection level. But mine is one of the most powerful, quite honestly, that Dr. Leota has ever seen, because not only did they kill the virus with such high effectiveness, but they have not waned. That's what makes it incredible. For example, if you get the flu, like in December, you probably wouldn't catch the flu again the rest of that flu season because you have antibodies built up from that first bout with the flu that would protect you for the next few months. Mm-hmm. Most people's antibodies almost overwhelmingly wane after two to three months. Mine have not. I just got tested again recently, and my super antibodies are still at a maximum level two and a half years now after my infection. It yeah, basically sorry. means the super antibodies are running, running through my body and killing everything right now. There's a chance I may not even get a common cold ever again the rest of my life. It's insane. That is amazing. Obviously, you participated in this research study at George Mason. What can researchers or what, what do the scientists that you're working with hope to gain from studying your condition and the super antibodies you have? What are the potential applications of this as you sure. understand it? Sure. Well, the first and most immediate thing is because my antibodies haven't waned, that means that people like me, either me or people like me, you could use my blood to either mass reproduce the antibodies to either make a permanent vaccine or make a treatment for COVID. Right now, my blood kills every form of virus. It's absolutely insane. And which makes it so amazing, again, that one of the few people, for example, in the study I was in, there were seven people, I was one of seven people found to have super antibodies. Mine were among the most powerful, and mine were the only ones that did not wane, which makes my blood, that, that of people like me, perfect for a permanent vaccine. And so now when you look at talking about a possible permanent vaccine to COVID, but also like the SARS virus and stuff like that, the SARS virus, which of course killed a lot of people in the Far East 10 years ago and still going on, is also a coronavirus and it also originates from bats. So the, the implications go much further. Then the fact that right now I can't even get a common cold right now, the how and why my body did this is the million dollar question. You could get the human body, just in general, everybody's bodies, to respond in the same way, the implications for us what it can mean as far as fighting sickness, as far as fighting disease, is, is mind-boggling. And obviously that, that has potential huge benefits if that can be harnessed and shared with, with the world from a, a vaccination perspective, as you said. But also, I gather that in addition to being something of a medical marvel, the publicity surrounding this actually went global, it went worldwide, and it also got uh, some strange reactions. I heard there was a, a marriage proposal from an unknown person. Tell there me was, tell me just uh, about, you know, while it's obviously novel and, and I'm, as we said, a sort of a blessing, uh, I'm sure there was also an interesting curiosity factor and, and perhaps maybe if not a downside to this, uh, just uh, exposure to, uh, you know, some, some unexpected responses from uh, other people. Sure. sure. And being a former journalist, and of course, I was at the Atlanta Journal Constitution for a long time and among other places, I knew it was going to generate a lot of buzz, although I had no earthly idea it was going to be, be as crazy as it was. I've received more than 10,000 messages from around the world including a marriage proposal from a woman in Spain. I declined, by the way. <laughs> and uh, it was insane. But, you know, and I remember talking to Dr. Leota about it a lot. I, of course, stay in touch with him regularly and talk with him regularly. And I was just telling him one day just how amazed I was at the reach. And I think I, I think there have been stories done on me in more than 120 countries at this point. And I knew friends of mine were in Taiwan, see pictures of me in the papers in Taiwan. I remember there's a story in India, I had my front page, the front page paper in New Delhi had my mugshot on it, and it had headline, COVID-19, worst nightmare. That was the headline in a paper in New Delhi, India. I mean, just stuff like that, it's just mind-boggling to see it. And as I talked to Dr. Yoder about it, he pointed out to me, this is a pandemic that's killed over 6 million people around the world, including more than a million Americans. Mortuaries were filling up. The entire global economy shut down. 
It was just despair and bad news about COVID everywhere. And Dr. Leota, when I just figured it out, it was basically my story was a story of hope, a story that mankind is still in the fight. And we're going to win this thing. We just have to keep the faith. It's right. amazing how much it, it's really resonated. It's really been mind-boggling to me. I appreciate that positive outlook and that encouraging perspective you have, and really that you and others like you with this rare condition, you know, could be part of the solution to vaccines and other treatment for a viral outbreaks. So that's really uh, encouraging. You mentioned your work as a journalist uh, and and previously working at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Uh, I gather that you were a sports journalist in your time, and also that you were a pro wrestling fan, uh, and and perhaps have even <laughs> written a book about uh, about pro wrestling. Tell tell me a little bit about prior to your role at George Mason, uh, your professional sure. path. Um, I was a sports writer my almost my entire career. I started out actually my first job out of college was a freelance star in Fredericksburg. I was at Potomac News. I was at Gainesville Sun in Florida. I covered the Gators football. I was a lead writer of men's basketball, so I did a lot of traveling. I mean, I've covered five Final Fours, Super Bowls, the Olympics, college basketball, pretty much every major football and basketball venue in this country I've been to at some point or another. It was just crazy, crazy career. I, you know, so of course, nobody was well, more well-versed in journalism than I was. So it's kind of funny, you know, always asking the questions and writing the stories. Now, all of a sudden, you're on the opposite end and uh, <laughs> becoming the story, which is, you know, as a journalist, you, you never try to do, but in this case, it can really be helped. But um, as far as the pro wrestling stuff, when I was at the Atlanta Journal Constitution, I was the lead writer for the AJC. Well, I don't know if you remember when Chris Benoit, the tragedy of Chris Benoit, killed his family, his wife and son, mm-hmm. and took his own life. And I was the lead writer for that. And it was those stories were crazy how big they got. Pro wrestling cuts across every demographic, black, white, rich, poor, young and old, and everything. And in, dur- in doing that, while well, that coverage for six months, basically, I was a de facto pro wrestling beat writer for one of the biggest papers in America. And in doing that, I met former professional wrestler Lex Luger. He became good friends of mine. And Lex asked me to write a book with him. So in 2013, we, he and I wrote a book that came out together. It did really well and uh, still stay in touch with Lex all the time. That's a, a fascinating story. And, and as you say, a bit of a role reversal going from being on one side of the microphone to the other side of the microphone. John, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. Before we conclude, it is a tradition here on the podcast to ask our guests a pair of personal questions that are a little bit offbeat and fun and quirky. To keep things interesting, we have developed a list of 10 mystery questions. And so I'd like to ask you to choose two numbers between (laughs) 1 and 10, and then I'll ask you the corresponding questions. 4 and 7. Okay, 4. This is a newer addition to the list. Which, if any of the following things, do you consider most plausible? Bigfoot, the abominable snowman, the Loch Ness Monster, Chupacabra, the Jersey Devil, or UFOs and aliens? And if none of those apply, but you believe in something else along those lines that perhaps is outside of the mainstream, please share what that thing might be. Uh, For me, it's UFOs. And I say that because one time I've actually seen unidentified flying objects. I wasn't the only person there. Leaving a University of Georgia football game one night, driving back to Atlanta, and there were a series of UFOs above us. And I pulled over the side of the road, and there were about 25 people with me, all standing out of our car looking at it. So I've seen them myself. So I, I would definitely go with UFOs. And we know that the federal government did, within the last year or two, acknowledge that there are, I think, something like of, of the thousands of, of reports of unidentified flying objects. I think they said there were something like 140 or so episodes that had been reported that they could not discount or otherwise explain. So you chose number four, and then I think you said seven. Is that correct? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Well, this is a this is a perfect question for you, in fact. If you could choose one superpower to have or any one skill to instantly master, what would it be and why? And you already have one superpower, so beyond that, what what would you choose? I would love to fly. I've, I've done a lot of stuff. I've taken zero gravity flights. I've taken. I've gone skydiving solo twice, and I've you know, done all kinds of flights. I, I'd love to fly. To me, to be able to fly would be the coolest thing in the world. Up, up, and away. Well, listen, John, I do want to thank you again for being with us and for sharing your unique and and fascinating story. And with that, that is going to bring us to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you like what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so that you know when new episodes are available. And we want to once again thank our guest, John Hollis, for joining us today. So thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.